So today's video is going to focus on a brief kind of introduction to the reproductive systems, and then we're going to focus on the male anatomy and physiology, and then in later videos we'll focus on female. So let's spend just a second um, reminding ourselves exactly what reproduction means. So a little freshman biology, remember that meiosis is the formation of those gametes. Gametes are what we also call sex cells, which would be sperm in the males and eggs in, in the females. And these cells are unique because they only have half the chromosomes that the original parent cell had. So remember, we're going to focus on humans only since that's what we're talking about here, right? Human cells have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Remember, our chromosomes are organized in pairs. So we have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs in every cell that we have. Well, when we make these gamete cells, we go through the process of meiosis, which we can see happening in our diagram over here on the right. Let me actually just use this diagram and put numbers in there. So again, humans have 46. So when I go through meiosis, my cells are going to divide two times. You can see here I've got meiosis one, and then I have meiosis two, and it's a little bit hard to see. Okay? And the cell has divided two times. And these final cells, if you look at them, they have less chromosomes than this initial parent cell did. So now what we have are 23 single chromosomes. So I don't have pairs anymore. Okay, remember over here we started with 23 pairs. I had 46 chromosomes in total. Now at the end of meiosis, I end up with 23 single chromosomes. And each one of these gametes are unique. Again, I know the picture isn't super amazing, but if you look closely, you can see how there's like light blue and red, um, like a dark purpley and red. So these gametes are not the same as each other. This is why you're not identical to your siblings. Okay? Um, and these gametes are going to be mixed together to form new organisms. This is how when we say we get half our DNA from our parents, okay, half our DNA from our mom, half of our DNA from our dad, because these gametes, so let's say that these are the sperm cells. So these gametes are going to combine with an egg cell. And now I'm going to form this new organism here, this new baby, that is going to have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Those, those chromosomes in the mom, they're going to pair, the chromosomes in the egg are going to pair up with the chromosomes that code for the same thing in, um, with the sperm cells. And so I end up with these 23 pairs or 46 in total. So I have to go through meiosis to form the gamete cells, basically to cut the chromosome number in half, because we don't want a baby with 90 some odd, 90, you know, 92 chromosomes. A, that's actually a problem. That's too many, right? One extra chromosome leads to problems like Down syndrome, much less an entire extra set. So the process of reproduction is kind of all of these things. So it's the formation of the gametes. That's step one. We got to have formation of the gametes with meiosis. We then need those gametes to come together. So we can see in our diagram here, that's what fertilization is, is when the gametes from the two organisms, so in our case, we're talking about male and female gametes come together. That is the zygote. Okay, so that's what the zygote is, is this new organism. Basically, it's the fertilized egg. Okay? It's where the cell that's formed when the egg and the sperm come together. So this here is going to be my zygote, this bottom portion down here. And then the third step of reproduction is the actual growth and development, the growth and the development of the organism. And this, so then this um, cycle will continue. A, the new organism will eventually grow and develop enough where it goes through meiosis and makes gametes and then fertilization may happen, etc. Okay, so we're going to briefly touch on development and puberty. Okay, I understand that um, gender in society is a hot topic currently and that gender can be fluid for a lot of people. We aren't really talking about that right now. We're talking more about biological male and female determination um, because that is an important part of reproduction. And there are different forms of the species for reproduction, for this, this form of sexual 
reproduction to happen so that we get more variety. More variety within the species is beneficial to the species as a whole. And so we are designed to have separate male and female. And so that's our focus here is biological male and female determination. So male and female is determined by what we call the SRY gene. The SRY gene is found on the Y chromosome. If most of y'all remember um, from biology, again, that females are XX and males are XY. So actually everybody kind of starts off in an XY format. Okay? And so what will happen is a few weeks into pregnancy, about week six, seven, maybe eight, a um, reproductive organs have already actually started to form, but in the beginning they're identical in male and females. A, and then what will happen is this SRY gene will either turn on, turn on or it will not. A, and so if the SRY gene turns on, so SRY gene turns on, what that does is that results in a functioning Y chromosome, which we can see here is a male. Okay? So if that SRY gene turns on, basically this causes the production of testosterone. And while females produce some testosterone, we do not produce nearly as much as males. And so the um, when the SRY gene turns on, that triggers the production of enough testosterone that will then develop those organs that were formed already, those reproductive organs that were already formed. It will then trigger their development into male reproductive organs. So basically what you have, kind of like most of you are familiar probably with stem cells, you basically have these neutral organs, right? So we've got these neutral sex organs that have formed Right, and so SRY gene turns on, then they become male organs. The testosterone triggers that. If the SRY gene is not turned on, then they become female organs because there's not enough testosterone to trigger them to become male organs. Okay. Either male or female, these organs are essentially non-functional for the first 8 to 14 years of our life okay, due to our hormone levels. A, um, and so our hormone levels will kind of dictate our final maturation of the reproductive system. And that's what puberty is. So when we go through puberty, we're going through that final maturation of the reproductive system, turning these organs into functioning organs. A, um, puberty officially lasts from the beginning of when those secondary sex characteristics start to form until we reach our adult height. A, um and that puberty is both stimulated and controlled by various hormones. And we will um, get more into depth in hormones in particular in females. Okay? But really, our main one here is what we call gonado, for the gonads, gonadotropin releasing hormone. Basically, what this hormone does is it tells the other what we call sex hormones, it calls these other sex hormones to start their production, okay, so that they can signal this the puberty to continue. So in females, those the female development or those female secondary sex characteristics, those are the increased uh, breast growth, hair growth in the underarms, in the groin area, menarche, okay, or start, starting to have our period or our cycle, okay, and changes to the female pelvis allowing changing uh, changes a little bit the size of the pelvic outlet um, all things getting ready to either house and or birth a baby okay? and then male secondary sex characteristics um, you're going to see an increase in growth in the uh, male organs so an increase in growth of the scrotum the penis the testes a okay? um, also hair growth both pubic hair and underarm hair, like females, more facial hair in males. And then you also see some changes in the larynx and the voice box. Okay? This is where males' voices usually change and deepen a little bit. Okay, so ideally you've already labeled your diagram and we can just quickly talk about what these things do. So we're obviously focused here on the male reproductive system. So we're going to start down with the scrotum and the testes. So the scrotum contains 
the two testes. So there are two testes and then all of the associated ducts because uh, basically the sperm is going to be formed in the testes and then it needs to travel to down the penis so that it can be ejaculated. So the scrotum is going to contain the two testes and all the ducts associated with the sperm formation and moving the sperm along. So the testes are located externally because the temperature is actually slightly cooler. And slightly cooler than body temperature actually increases sperm production. So that's why the testes are housed outside of the body. Okay, on top of the testes here, kind of at the top of the scrotum, is the epididymis. The epididymis is really almost like a ligament, right, just helping hold the testes in place. Okay. Within the testes will be what are called the seminiferous tubules. The seminiferous tubules are where sperm is actually formed. So again, these are within the testes, and this is where the sperm is actually forming in these little tubules that you will find um, within the testes. Next would be this vas deferens, which is also sometimes called the ductus deferens. Okay, this is this entire tube that is leading up from the testes, okay, um, and then passing through other various glands on the way to the penis. So the vas deferens or the ductus deferens, this is going to be the duct that's going to take the sperm back up to the pelvic cavity. So again, getting it back up to the pelvic cavity so it can move through the various glands on its way to then travel out of the um, out through the penis. This becomes part of what's called the spermatic cord. Okay, and so the spermatic cord is going to be all of this here and this here. Basically, the spermatic cord is going to be is going to be the ductus deferens or the vas deferens, as well as the arteries and veins that go down to supply the testes. Even though they're not located within inside the body, they still need a blood supply, and so the spermatic cord is made up of those let the blood supply as well as the ductus or the vas deferens. Okay, the penis itself is how the sperm is actually delivered into the female. Okay, the sperm, the sperm, the penis consists of erectile tissue, which is where the blood will pool. Okay, and so when the blood pools, that allows the penis to enlarge and makes the penis more rigid. Therefore, it can be inserted into the vagina. The urethra is housed within the penis. It's the tube that travels, um, that is traveling down through the penis there. The urethra is where males will urinate through the urethra, as well as that is where ejaculation will occur as well. So it is the same tube for both. So the release of the sperm from the penis is called ejaculation, and that is actually a mixture of sperm and fluid. So that is the semen, and there are going to be 20 to 150 million sperm cells per milliliter of semen. So there is a ton of sperm cells that are released um, each time ejaculation occurs. A, the fluid that is um, surrounding the sperm that is released with the se as you know part of the semen is going to be an alkaline fluid. A, alkaline meaning that it is not acidic. Uh, the female vagina is acidic, and so the alkalineness of the fluid helps neutralize that. It's going to contain fructose. Fructose is a sugar which will actually provide nutrients to the sperm because the sperm have to travel. Once they are ejaculated from the male, they still have to swim and travel. There will also be various enzymes. Sorry, I had a menu come out on my computer. There will also be various enzymes contained within there and proteins. Again, all to help support the sperm on their journey um, you know, into the vagina. The these secretions that are part of the semen, they are going to come from the prostate, okay, which we can see located 
all your labels are on the same side here, which we can see located right here. A, there is the prostate gland. You can see how um, sometimes as men age, they complain um, about the prostate and it making it difficult for them to urinate. And you can see how that would be possible due to the prostate's location. Right? It is, um, you'll notice the urethra, the top of the urethra is traveling there through the prostate. Okay, so the prostate, the um, seminal vesicle, which is back here. Okay, so the prostate, the seminal vesicle, and the bulbourethral gland. Or, okay, so I was looking for our labels. So the bulbourethral gland is right underneath the prostate. Okay, so these are all going to contribute to this um, semen. So most of the neutralizing agents, sugars, enzymes, those are going to come from those seminal vesicles. Okay, the prostate is also, I'm going to go this direction with it, the prostate is also helping neutralize with alkaline and the sugar. And then the bulbourethral gland is, in addition, is also releasing what are called mucoproteins. So a specific kind of protein, muco for mucus, to help lubricate the urethra so that everything can pass through it easily. Okay, so this is the basics of the male anatomy and um, the uh, formation of the seminal fluid and how it would be released. And our other videos then will focus on female anatomy.